I'm Marcus. Uh, you can find me online at Marcus CCM at pretty much anything. Uh, I work for a cool company called Totworks, and they are gently sponsoring my trip here. I'm coming all the way from Scotland, although I'm from Brazil. And this is a disclaimer I have to make. I actually like microservices, but you're gonna see throughout this talk that it's gonna seem like I don't, but I do. <laughs> so, let's start, like the mythical monolith. So it's like a billion line code base that does all the things your, your organization needs to do, right? I think it's starting to become a common thing in Ruby, like we are beyond the being cool phase now, like we're just on the getting shit done phase. So we, we start like, a small startup start building like their services and those services starts to grow and then they add more functionality and this code bases grow a little more and then they pivot and they, they add more stuff, blah, blah, blah. And you get to a point where you have this really like big code base that does all the things. And we can all probably agree that that's not a good idea, right? Everybody here probably has like horror stories about having to deal with those code bases. It's one of those things like you touch one line and you, you break stuff like 10 classes to the side, you have no idea what you're doing. Like the name monolith becomes like really, a really good description because it's one of those things you find in the middle of the woods and you wonder like, who the hell built this thing? Why? So probably not a good idea. And we have many ways of getting, trying to get out of a break our monoliths. And one of the currently popular ways is called microservices. So what's a microservice? It's a small code base with a single well-defined functionality. So the idea is to apply like the Unix philosophy of having like small little things and, uh, and then combining those things to get to, to reach your goals. It's, it's, uh, the term is re relatively recent. It's starting to uh, around 2011. And now I'm starting, to, it's more of a Java thing, but I'm starting to see people speaking about it in Ruby conferences. So in those services, they usually communicate through a REST-ish interface, like, which sadly in our industry, it means they use HTTP, it doesn't mean much else. Uh, and the whole thing is like trying to apply like all the good stuff, like the single responsibility principle to a service-oriented architecture. So microservices are not exactly new. Right? It's just trying to do services in a good way. So we move from this like monorail, monolith, whatever, to many microservices. Like, and those things have, have like a heap of benefits. You can say they're easily replaceable. Like they're, they're small, so you can, if you don't like one service, you can go and like throw it away and write a new service. And you don't have to worry about all the other services. And they're technology to couple. So you can have a Ruby server talk, service talking to a Java service, talking to a Go service, talking to like whatever hipster language you like to use, and you can keep doing that. They're easy to understand because they're small, so you can, you can fit the whole code base in your head. And they also have provide a natural work stream separation. So like as your company grows and you start to divide people into teams, you can assign services to each of those teams. And, you don't have people stepping in each other's toes like that much because they, they, they communicate through a more well-defined interface. And you can say like with this little bundles of joy, you eliminate all complexity in your life. When you start using microservices, you're, you're done. Right? Right, right, right? Well, of course not, right? Like we have, we have, we have a very like hype-driven culture and we People come to stage and they, they like throw an idea and people you just jump to it because it sounds so cool. But everything comes with a, everything is made of trade-offs. And I, I like to think like ideas that actually reduce complexity are pretty rare. What you usually do is we move complexity around. So when you have a simple service, you, you end up with a complex ecosystem. We don't we. So those services are simple, but your, your, like, your whole thing, it isn't. You, start, you have to start worrying about a, a loads of stuff, like so deploying. If you had a hard time deploying a single app, imagine deploying 30, 50. It doesn't, so performance, like HTTP is not the fastest thing out there. So and when, you start, and when you start to have all those services calling all those services, because they're so micro that actually don't do anything by themselves, so uh, it gets slow. Security, you cannot just shove data in a session anymore. You have to like really worry about how do I authenticate stuff, monitoring, like 
All sorts of stuff become really complicated when you enter this microservices realm. So different teams working on different tech stacks. That sounds amazing, right? Yeah. But it's kind of like a complicated situation because like, you have to know how to use all those technolo different technologies, how to deploy those things, how to monitor those things. Like, you have to understand a lot of ecosystems to operate all those different services. And of course, a thing that gets really hard is acceptance tests or integration tests, customer tests, coffee break tests, whatever you like to call them. Like, those, <laughs> those, th those tests, they're basically, they're tests to answer this question, like how you make sure a service works well with other services. So I have, I have an opinion that tests are only good as their failure messages. So when you, when you go and start in testing like microservices, especially if you go for a UI, you, you get stuff like this, expected to find element item, couldn't, which doesn't help. So where you, you run like the, you run those your tests in your CI pipeline, and they usually they, they usually take more than minutes. They are like they take a lot, and in the end you get a red message: couldn't find element. And I don't know, I get really frustrated. I start screaming, "Why?" Because it doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you anything. It, it can be like 500 reasons for why you couldn't find the element. It's probably not a CSS bug. So I think. And when we talk about services, there's also another question. How do you make sure you're not ruining someone else's day? So we're not talking about well-defined APIs here. Those services are evolving really quickly. And usually, since, since the customer of those services is your own company, we're not as professional with those APIs as we would be if it was a public thing. So they change all the time. And you have to be, you have to be sure like, how you're not breaking other people's stuff. Usually, like, you want to change your API, you change, a test breaks, you fix your test. That doesn't mean that all other tests that rely on that code, all the, all the code is working, right? Your stuff is working. But what about other people's? And it's not like you can go, like, Twitter, you're not Twitter, you're not Facebook, you cannot go there, like, this is my new API, deal with it. Like, you have to worry about the other departments in your organization, the other teams. So over time, uh, I, I face this problem a lot. Uh, working uh, like um, I think like for for quite a while working with microservices, and I, I had several ideas on how to handle those things, how to handle those tests. So first idea, run all the services in your in your ecosystem in your in your dev box. So before you run your tests, you basically download everything there is to, and you run your tests. So this can work. The problem is like as you have all those different kind of technologies and like you have to know how to get those things to run. Like it might be simple, it might be well structured, it might be not. So, and as, as you move through like a CI pipeline and everything, it's starting to get complicated to have everything running in your local machine and having your tests hitting all those local services. So it, it, it didn't work it didn't very well for me. So another idea, run your tests against a shared environment. So we have like a dev environment or a QA environment or whatever, and you, you keep the, the services alive in these environments and you run your tests against those services. So this can also work, but most companies have a hard time maintaining a sane production environment. When you start talking about dev environments, they're usually a mess. So you, this, like running your tests against those environments, it adds a lot of noises to those messages because you, you start to worry about network failures and like, network slowness and all sort of like unpredictable stuff and your, your tests start to go build flaky. Nothing, nothing is, is worse than a flaky test. Like you run your test, oh, it's red. And you run again, oh, now it's green. And then you run again, oh, it's red. You're like, damn it. <laughs> so it, it really like, it, it kills all the, the confidence you have when you have flaky tests. So running tests against a shared environment also didn't work for me. The third idea, stop all the things. Like, you build like your own stubs for each service. Might be like we're using some automated tool. Might be just some little Ruby code. And you you run your tests against those stubs. It can work. The problem like this can lead you to live like in a fantasy stub land where every, where every everything just works. Like it's really hard to keep the the stubs in sync with whatever is happening in your. So you, you have to worry, oh, if someone changes this, I have to go and change my stub as well. 
So like running everything against stubs also doesn't work. Fourth idea, like VCR, all the things. Like VCR is a very popular tool, uh, and it's really cool. Like it basically records all the HTTP interactions your 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 service is doing, and allows you to replay those interactions for your for for your tests. So it's kind of like stubs, but with the the thing with VCR is that you you can delete the cassettes as they call the like the, the the recordings and record them again. So you have you have you, you have the speed of the stubs, but you can also make sure your stubs are actually real. You can re replay them. So VCR is very cool when you're having like, when you're talking to GitHub or Facebook and, but when you start to add like 30 different services, those cassettes, they get very noisy. Like they're not make, they're not human readable at all. And like, I, I, I work in a big project with VCR, like every commit, there'll be a bunch of changes in the cassettes because like some services return dates and this kind of things, they always change. And it, adds a lot, it also adds a lot of adds noise. So VCR for, service, for microservices, I don't think it works either. So let me tell you a sad story. This is a sad story moment. So I was working in one of those microservices projects, and I wanted to change something. I wanted to change the API. And like all those APIs were evolving very quickly. So it's not like we had version numbers. Like Version numbers require you to be, have some sort of stability. And basically, what we had to do is like every time we, we had to change something, I had to go around and ask people, hey, are you using that? No? Hey, are you? You using that function? No. Oh, you using that? No. OK, good. Now I can, I can change stuff, which if you, if you, like, if you, if you felt very stupid. So I, I, I tried to research a lot for like, what, what, how can we fix this? It brings me to my final idea. You can run your integrated tests in isolation. What the hell? That makes no sense. So different things, like isolate your tests with executable contracts. Huh? Contracts? So what's a contract, like in the test sense? It's the subset of functionality a service needs from another service. So it's not the same as, the, as the, a service API. It's whatever you need from that service. So your, a contract between two services can be a single field in a single HTTP call, because that's what you need. So that's a contract. You have like a, a, like a, re, a request, like users and a, a name, and you get back like a name and a date in a JSON track. So that, that server, that server can return, like, can have many other endpoints, and it can return much more data, but you don't care. You, need, you, you only care about those two fields because that's what your app uses. So that's your contract. And actually, you care about the structure. You don't care about the values, right? So you, you care that the name is a string and age is an integer. If name suddenly became an array of names, you might break yourself. So that's, that's a, like an a example of a contract. So it goes like that. You have a service A that needs some functionality from a service, a service B. So let's call A the consumer and B the producer. So you, you have this interaction going on around you. So what do you do? You write uh, this contract. You, you basically you write a specification for how that dependency works, what, what's, what the consumer needs from the producer. And then you have these contracts. You, you, you somehow you make your tests to run against stuff that were generated from that contract. So a consumer can talk only to the, the, those, the, those contracts. But you have also have the ability to get the same contracts and try to validate them against the provider. So, and that's the, the important bit here. Like those contracts, they work both ways. So you have the consumer validating against the contract and the contract validates against the provider. So you don't end up in, in fantasy stub land. And he also, it's a little more like, you have to put more thought into it. It's not like VCR where it's just like a big thing. It, it's a more craft thing. You might be thinking, oh, that's just a stub, right? You just told me you don't like stubs. So no, it's like a declarative self-validating stub. And we like to use contracts because it's shorter. So with using this, you have isolated and integrated tests at the same time. And there is a gem for that. Yeah. So, I was, in this project, we wrote a gem called Pacto, which basically means Pact in Portuguese, so for, to, to do those contract tests in Ruby. And funny enough, when we released this, another Totworks team in Australia released a gem, uh, a, a Java library called Pact that does the same thing. So now Totworks has Pacto and Pact. 
<laughs> so for Pack2, we, we choose to define the contracts as a JSON schema file. So JSON schema is just like XML schema, but for JSON, so it's shorter. So this is an example of a contract in Pack2 land. So you have a name, because the idea is like you want to have uh, every interaction between services to be something very well-defined, so you, you can give a name to that. You have a request and a response. So the request can contain headers, like the, the required headers, a method, just because we need to generate stuff from it, and a path. A response contains a status and like some properties, and the properties are like have types. So this, this thing describes like a, uh, an HTTP request and a JSON response. So from, from this contract, we can generate both the stubs and the validation things. So this is how you can use the, the pack to, to, to use the stubs. You basically, you, you ask pack to load contracts from a folder. So the idea is that you, you, you could have like a folder for, for a service or something. And on this folder, you're gonna have many of these um, this JSON schema files. And you load them all, and you say, hey, stub providers. So when you do that, we use uh, a web mock, the same thing the VCR uses uh, beneath the covers, to hook into the, the Ruby HTTP libraries and basically stub the services. So whenever you hit the, the, the endpoints that you provide in your contracts, if you pass the specific headers and everything, you get back the response. So good. You can run your tests against the stubs generated by those contracts. And the cool thing is the validation side of it. So you can use the same contracts, same folder, and it, instead of asking to stub it, you ask it to simulate the consumer. So in a different point in your pipeline or, or like in a different point in time, you go and, hmm, are my contracts still valid or do I have a problem? And then you do that. And when, when they're not valid, you get a very specific message because we know the types and the, the structure of the response you need. So you get like, hey, I was expecting name to be a string and now name is an array of names. Your, your contract's broken. So this is a specific message. If you, if you see this, you, can, you, you instantly know what's going on, which is quite different from what you usually have when you, when you see a uh, failure in the integration test that it's like, mm, I have to try to run this locally because I have no idea. Of, like, this is a very precise thing. So when you start using those contracts, you can move to the next level of contractness, which is consumer-driven contracts. So consumer-driven contracts is a similar idea, but they have, with a twist. So say the service A needs some functionality. So service A go and writes a contract. So you, you write your contract before the functionality is implemented. So kind of like TDD, like it's a contract-first approach, if you like. So you, ha you have this functionality, that this draft of a functionality you need that still doesn't exist. And then you go to a producer, and to the producer team, or it might, be, it might be even your own team, and say, hey, we need this thing. Can you provide me? And then you might have a negotiation on top of this contract, like, ah, I can provide this field, but I cannot provide this, where, oh, no, this is really good. We can do it. And from the point you, you both teams agree on that contract, you can have the, the consumer team implementing whatever they are planning to do with that functionality, while the provider team is implementing the functionality itself, and they can use that contract to keep things in sync. So it allows teams to evolve in parallel, but still like keeping the communication going through the contract. And the good thing is like once, once you have those contracts in place from the provider perspective, you know exactly how each service is using your functionality. So if you wanted to like change some stuff, you know who, who you are affecting, so we don't have to do like I, I had to and go around asking. You, you can say, yeah, team service X needs this, and service X is handled by team B. So you can go to team B and have a conversation. Or if you look, hey, no one actually uses this thing. I can delete it. It's awesome. And from the, the consumer point of view, you, you know exactly like how, you're the, each of, how you communicate with each of your dependencies, and if one of those dependencies break, you, you have a well-defined message. So you know what's going on. And the idea is to, of this consumer-driven thing is to put the focus back on the consumer. So 
the only reason you have an API from a microservice is because someone needs it. So it makes sense instead of thinking about oh, what cool things can this service provide, you start to think in, hmm, what people need from this service. So it, it flips the, the relationship. And you have this good communication too. It's like if you work in a bigger, in a larger team, you, just, you, you have this precise thing that people can run code against and assert, make assertions to, to discuss. So it's not like you're just sending emails where if JSON pasted on it. You have a good thing to base your discussion upon. So that's what I have. Quick recap. Microservices are amazing. They're really cool. But they bring a lot of challenges. Uh, and one of those challenges is testing. And you can test in isolation with this, this idea of executable contracts. And you can use consumer-driven contracts to evolve your services in interesting ways. So if you want to know more, like I'll send these links in the presentation later. And that's all I have. Obrigado.